25 years ago, I decided that I wanted to change the future around climate change. So I started a nonprofit organization, and one of the things that we did was to um, organize the Race to Stop Global Warming. Um, this was going to be like a race for the cure. My vision was 10,000 people out in the streets with t-shirts on, uh, talking about the real race to stop global warming, the need to rewire the world with clean energy. Uh, we started in Portland, Oregon in 2000. Um, by 2003, we were running in uh, eight cities, uh, Central Park in New York, Presidio um, in San Francisco, The Loop in Chicago. We had sponsorship from Nike, Toyota, Aveda, Cliff Bar, um, but we never quite made money. We needed 800 runners, we'd get 700 and 750, so we had to shut it down. So what were we trying to do with this race? What was the theory of change behind it? Well, in retrospect, we were trying to do three things. The first was to educate the runners and their communities about the real race to stop global warming. The second one was that we were trying to change the rules. So change minds was the first goal. Changing the rules was the second goal. We, we hoped that all these newly educated runners would reach out to their local, state, federal officials, pressure them to uh, change the rules and institute climate-friendly policy. And the third thing we were trying to do in emulating the race for the cure was to actually create a business that was in business to solve global warming. Right? Not a nonprofit, but a for-profit business that was designed to uh, expand globally uh, with a mission to, um, to stop global warming, to change the game. If you're here today, it's likely that you also want to change the future uh, around climate change, gender equity, systemic racism. Um, but how exactly can you do that? And I want to talk today with you about the three ways, and it turns out there are only three ways to change the future. These are the three theories of change that underlie the work of leaders and change agents around the world. I've got the best job in the world, um, and it forces me to think a lot about this moment that we're living in, this extraordinary moment, um, where um, uh, tens of thousands of years of human history are really crashing into the next three decades. Right? There are 8 billion of us on this planet, soon to be 9, likely to be 10. Half of those folks barely getting by and living on you know, less than $10 a day. Um, and everybody aspiring to more and a better quality of life. And we're already fighting over access to clean air and water, forest, fish, biodiversity. And it's getting hotter year after year after year. And sometimes you just don't want to wake up in the morning. You know, you just want to go back to bed, pull the covers over your head. But in many ways, this is the most exciting and decisive and fundamentally human time to be alive because of how much agency we have. No generations before us have had the, the networks, the technologies, the, the business models, um, and the opportunities to so profoundly change the future. 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, people will be looking back in time at this next three decades to see what we got done or what we failed to accomplish because it is so momentous, right? It will have such impacts on, on all of their worlds. So why do I have the best job? Well, uh, it's because I have the opportunity to work every day with young people who are facing this moment, who are really awake to it, and who are dedicating their, their working lives, their creativity, their energy to building a finer future. Okay, so how are they doing that? Well, these are the three ways, I'm going to tell you right now, the only three ways to work to changing the future. The first is to change minds through education. And these are familiar activities to all of us, teachers, professors, researchers, but also artists, filmmakers, journalists, imams, preachers, rabbis, anybody whose job it is to really change people's minds. Second way to change the future is through policy, changing the rules. Okay, policy people, their job is to get rid of bad laws and regulations and put in place good laws and regulations to drive sustainable outcomes. They're going to do this in and around government, local government, state, federal, uh, internationally through the UN but increasingly also within big organizations. So large corporations, big hospitals, educational institutions all have chief sustainability officers. And their job is really to change the rules internal to those organizations to drive sustainable outcomes. 
Of course, there's people in the policy world working outside of those systems, often in NGOs, where they're educating, advocating, lobbying, protesting to change the rules in government or to change the rules in business. Okay, the final way to do this is business, um, and, but particularly sustainable business, and this is about changing the game, right? And what's business even doing in this list? Well, no matter how many minds we change through education and how, how many rules we change through policy, at the end of the day, business has got to figure out how we're going to get this done. How are we going to feed 9 billion people? How are we going to keep the lights on, uh, get our health care in ways that radically, radically, radically cut pollution of all kinds, not just carbon, but plastics, toxics, impacts on biodiversity, environmental justice, while at the same time treating workers and communities and suppliers with justice and with respect because you can't have an ecologically engaged company that's not also socially responsible. All right, let's talk more about these, and we'll start with education. All right, climate education in particular, climate anxiety, scale of one to 10, where are you guys at? One is, you know, I don't really think about it. 10 is paralyzing anxiety. And I mean that in a literal sense, paralyzing, right? You can't sleep at night, you know, don't want to have kids because the world's going to be too dystopic. And really, you've just decided it's too late and you're just disengaged because it seems like it's hopeless, okay? Um, the climate education challenge really right now um, is not about, you know, explaining the science or helping people understand the impacts. It really is about helping people change their minds and get into a healthier relationship with this global challenge that we face, right? How do we move people up from kind of the three to, to six range where, yeah, they're thinking about it a little, um, up into, you know, the climate engaged and the climate warrior world where, you know, people are really thinking about how in my life, you know, in my workplace, um, in, my, in my home, with my family, as a voter, as a citizen, as an activist, how can I do the work, right? And really, it's about moving people, especially the tens, um, down from the cliff and into um, a mindset of climate repair, away from a mindset of climate despair, where so many people are right now, to a mindset of climate repair. We've done a lot of damage to the climate. We've got a lot of repair work to do. And that really, we have to think. We have to get up in the morning, do this work, then go home to you know, our friends, our partners, um, our families, and, you know, live our human lives because this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. We're gonna be in it for the long haul. Um, at BARD, we've been involved in a global climate education project uh, called the Worldwide Climate and Justice Education Week. We did it last year, we're doing it this year. Last year we had uh, over 300 schools, 50 countries, more than 50,000 people involved. Now, this is a straight up education project. We're not looking for any particular outcomes, but just by creating a platform for literally thousands of volunteers at those 300 schools to put on these events, really amazing things happen. Um, and in particular, one example, uh, our amazing team in the Philippines, led by Tony Suzuki, created a web resource for Filipino educators. Um, so, uh, quoting from the website, from a girl who was just curious about eco-friendly products to um, finding a passion for advocating for the environment, uh, Climate Papel was created for Filipino educators to raise awareness about climate change and to help hashtag make climate a class in the Philippines and everywhere. All right, that's number one, changing minds. Let's talk about changing the rules and policy. So I think you should get arrested every 25 years. It's good for the soul. Um, and the last time I did this was a dozen years ago. I got arrested with about 1,000 other people in front of the White House. Um, and the day before, 10,000 of us had actually surrounded the White House and given it a big hug. Um, and the purpose here was to influence President Obama, pressure him, to deny a permit for the Keystone oil pipeline. This was a pipeline that was going to run from the dirty tar sands oil in northern Canada down to Houston, where the oil would be refined and exported. Um, and he did it. The day after we got arrested, Obama denied the permit. Over the next nine years, through protests at Standing Rock and elsewhere, um, uh, the project was delayed and delayed, and then in 2020, it was actually canceled. It's never been built. Policy change happens from this kind of outside-the-system pressure combined with a lot of inside-the-system hard work, and you really need both. And it's super powerful, 
right? If you get this done, here in New York, we've got great climate policy, actually the best in the world. And part of that is uh, we're going to build a whole new industry that didn't, still doesn't exist and certainly didn't exist two or three years ago. We're going to build 9,000 megawatts of, of offshore wind. This is the equivalent of six really big power plants, enough to power 30% uh, of New York uh, State's entire energy load. It's going to create tens of thousands of jobs. At the federal level, after three decades of gridlock, we finally got a good climate bill. Um, and uh, among other things, that's going to ensure that by the year 2030 or so, almost every new vehicle coming off the assembly line is going to be electric. And both of these things are huge steps in the direction of stabilizing the climate. Okay, we've talked about changing minds. We've talked about changing rules. Let's talk about changing the game. All right, ultimately, any vision of a sustainable future relies on the idea of, of regenerative business enterprise, okay? The idea here is that through radical, often ecologically inspired business model innovation, it's actually possible to design out waste and exploitation from the system, um, uh, create models that radically cut pollution, treat communities and workers with justice, um, and in doing all that, actually outcompete traditional businesses that rely on the exploitation of nature and people. My friend Alyssa Hammond, who is the sustainability director at Cliff Bar, likes to say that this kind of business is gonna think like a tree, right? Get all of its uh, power from the sun, ensure that in the, its production processes, all waste from one production process is food for another, a truly circular economy, all waste is food. Um, and finally, uh, trees and regenerative businesses need to leave the world around them richer in productive assets, okay? Now, that's a great metaphor, but in a capitalist system, is this really possible? Well, this idea went mainstream in the 2010s with lots, uh, lots several, many, large corporations actually self-consciously trying to move their work to center it around some environmental or social mission. They hired chief sustainability officers to help lead these efforts. They began reporting on many aspects of their environmental, social, and governance performance. And the uh, uh, B Corp certification process emerged as a kind of guiding star to uh, direct the, um, the mission and the activities of a, of a whole new generation of explicitly mission-driven businesses that emerged around this idea of regenerative enterprise. Over the last decade, young people have really been at the forefront of holding companies accountable to these missions. And many of them have been training themselves, getting experience, and actually going into these companies to actually do the work and test the hypothesis and see how fast and how far we can push companies in this direction of becoming more and more sustainable, more and more regenerative. Here's one example. In 2019, Etsy became the first really big company to make a major public climate commitment. And they committed to offsetting um, all of their uh, emissions from shipping, 90% of their emissions. And they did it pretty quickly. And we know exactly where this idea came from. It came from this woman, Chelsea Mosen. She developed this idea in, when she was in a graduate program here at Bard, um, and it was her capstone um, while she was interning at Etsy. Um, Etsy liked the idea, they liked her, they hired her onto the energy team. Four years later, she was the chief sustainability officer and was in a position to push this new uh, 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 initiative through. Okay, four years after that, 2023, over 900 of the biggest 2,000 companies in the world have made public net zero commitments. Will they meet those commitments? In what time frame? Time will tell. Right? But ultimately, the only way through to a sustainable future um, to meet the needs of those eight, soon to be nine, likely to be 10 billion people is through an economic system based on regenerative enterprise. And young people are really leading this transformation. Okay, so I've told you today there's three and only three ways to change the future. But some of you are thinking, oh, I don't know. I mean, I wanna be a scientist or an engineer or a lawyer or something. You know, how does that fit into this system? And it's actually pretty easy. Are you gonna be a sustainable engineer who's an educator? 
Or are you going to try and use your talents to drive, you know, better policy that's better, you know, informed by sustainable engineering, better rules? Or do you want to work within the four walls of a business, a nonprofit or a for-profit, directly solving problems and using that sustainable engineering knowledge to build a more regenerative company? Those are the three choices. Um, and so let's, let's ask, put it out there. How many of you see yourselves as educators? Uh, okay, how about people who want to be policy people? Any of those in the audience? Um, all right, who wants to change the game? Um, who wants to do more than one? Uh, Who's unsure? All right. This, this is, you have to pick, right? If you want to do good work, you've got to pick your lane, know what you're doing, organize your work around one of those theories of change. We begin this talk today with a land acknowledgement. And the Muncie Mohican people lived here, literally right here in this place, right here. 10,000 years, sustainably, 400 human generations until they were forcibly removed in the last century. That land acknowledgement calls on us to honor those ancestors, um, but also the descendants, right? The people, and the more than people, the trees, the animals, the forests, the rivers that are going to be here and living together for the next 100 years, the next 1,000 years, the next 10,000 years. I've recently been gifted my own personal stake in that future, and in particular, the 22nd century. So my granddaughters, um, Lena and Addie, will be grandparent age themselves in the year 2101. I've got a few more decades myself to make their world as beautiful and prosperous and inclusive and sustainable as I can. Let's do that work together.